All right, so we are doing the afternoon update down here. It's day three of the retrial of the four men inside Eric Parker, Stephen Stewart, Scott Drexler, and Ricky Loveland. Today's been an, a really great day because it started raining, and I believe it was 70 degrees when we got here. So that is huge for us. Of course, we don't have all of our flags and signs out because we don't want them getting wet. Um, if it dries out a little bit later, we will do that. Um, so let's see, let's talk about this weekend. We did the stand event. That was huge. It's um, on InfoWars. They, it's the main story. Please go there, read it, see the video, share it. Um, thank Roger Stone for coming out here and, and speaking up for us because what we're seeing inside, the only way these guys are going to get out is with a presidential pardon um, or a dismissal of the case because what we're seeing inside is that there's a possible another hung jury, but we're not allowed to enter our um, evidence and we're really constricted to what we can even talk about. So um, that's an issue. What What is very important is that we keep getting this information out to people. So please go to InfoWars, share the story, um, go to Roger Stone's Facebook page, thank him for coming to Nevada and standing up for the political prisoners. Um, Yesterday at court, they showed Ricky Loveland's booking photo. They cut it up and just showed one of his tattoo. This is because last trial, they brought in an FBI agent to identify Ricky Loveland, and he pointed out a lawyer. So they're introducing their booking photos. This is detrimental um, because in the photo, you can see that he is chained. Um, he's in the orange, orange jumpsuit. It pretty much um, gives you the idea that he's already guilty. So then the lawyers went to Eric and Scott and they said, you know, they're going to come after your guys' tattoos as well. So in protest, they both rolled up their sleeves and showed the jury their tattoos yesterday in court. It was really great to talk to Eric last night. He was very positive, even with everything that was going on. You know, he said, if, they, if they're going to do this, if they're going to prevent us, then we'll just have to start protesting in the courtroom. And, and that's what they've begun to do. Um, so we started out the day today with the judge telling um, the defendants that they are not able to speak or mouth things at the jury during sidebar. And they're not to write things on a legal pad and show them to the jury. Apparently, Stephen Stewart mouthed something or said something and the jury could possibly hear him during one of the sidebars yesterday. It could have been something like, I don't, I, you know, I'm not sure. I do not believe that anyone wrote anything on a legal pad and showed it. Um, the defense, the prosecution um, wanted to know exactly what was said, and they said, well, you can talk to the defense about that. I believe that there was nothing shown. Um, so we go in, and, and we're still in cross-examination with Special Agent Saylor. He, um, they're bringing up, we're, we're still with Perez. Perez brings up a post from J.D. Parks. It's a private message to Ricky Loveland. But Ricky doesn't just respond to this message. So here he proves to the jury that, you know, what people send you is you don't have any control over that. All you have control over is what you reply or send out. So if it's a message that was sent to you and you never even replied, how do you know he even saw it? Um, then he brought up the picture of Ricky and Todd, the one where they say he has his hand on the gun. And in the picture, they blow it up, and you can see the barrel underneath Todd. The, back, the butt of the gun is at uh, Ricky's side. His hand is down near it, and the barrel of the gun is below Todd. So you can see that it is not pointed anywhere, and you can see that it is not in his hand. And the agent had to say, yes, um, his hand is near the gun, not on the gun. Um, it also came out that they started the investigation on Bundy Ranch starting on April 7th with Ryan Payne, but they were looking into Jerry Burkhart and Ryan Payne since 2013. So they didn't start looking into Ricky until April 7th, but Ryan Payne and Jerry Burkhart, they already had on their radar since 2013. Then they brought up Carol Bundy's post and they highlighted the part saying she wanted it to remain peaceful. 
the family wanted it to remain peaceful. They brought that up again. Um, let's see, there was a post from Randy Eaton, um, and, and an objection to this. This was, uh, he said, what we are seeing is several media sources were talking about rising tensions, arresting the protesters, and a military-style standoff. He shows a bunch of different posts. What people are, are saying in these posts, we may not be able to talk about this, but if they bring in a post that, that talks about rising temper, tempers in Nevada, um, arresting the protesters, and military-style standoff, we can then bring that in. So the lawyer goes through all these different posts and he brings all these words in and he's just trying to show the jury that, that there is something that they're not showing you here. Then they bring up, and this is Marchese, he brings up that Saylor was one of the agents who helped arrest Eric Parker. There was an objection to this um, because it wasn't in direct examination. So he says, okay, well, if it's not in direct examination, then I would like to recall Saylor for the defense. What they're trying to get in here is the interview that Eric did with Saylor in the transport. Now, when Eric Parker was arrested, he was arrested in Ketchum, Idaho. He was not taken to our local office. He was immediately put in a vehicle and interviewed as he drove the two and a half hours to Boise, Idaho and booked there. So he's trying to get that interview brought in. They would not let it during this. Um, another thing, a lady on the prosecution side is chewing gum and blowing bubbles. She's an FBI agent that sits behind the prosecution. I believe she's FBI. And um, then when we're doing sidebars today, the court's kind of trying to get around making sidebars a negative thing to the jury. So now they have a bowl of candy and they're going to pass around a bowl of candy to all the jurors while sidebar is going on. Let's make it a positive thing. They all get every time there's a sidebar, they're going to get a piece of candy. Are we children? Not to mention that the observers are harassed if they have a piece of gum, if they have a, a tic-tac, a piece of gum, if we have anything in the courtroom, water bottles over 16 ounces, now they have a notice outside the court, a courtroom. Um, but yet the FBI is allowed to chew gum and blow bubbles with their gum, and they're gonna pass candy out to the jury to try to make it seem like sidebars are a good thing. Um, Tanasi goes up, and he brings up the fact that none of the emails go to Stephen Stewart directly and that there's numerous p e uh, emails from MOA and Ricky Loveland and none of them went to Stephen Stewart. Then we go into copy and post. Copy and paste. So they bring up one of the exhibits where somebody other than Ricky posts something and then later in the thread, because it's between a bunch of different people, he says it's from someone else. And so he brings, he gets the FBI agent on the stand to say that you cannot, he admits that copy and paste is not able to be noted on the log. They can't tell if it's something you drafted yourself or you copy and pasted it. Um, and that's creating a reasonable doubt for the jury because here obviously something is copy and pasted. We've talked about copy and paste and repost many times in the trial today. And, um, then it was brought up, how do you know the Facebook name is a real person? And the agent was kind of like, well, what do you mean? And he said, well, up there it says Billy the Kid. He said, how do you know Billy the Kid's really the Billy, Billy the Kid and who that person is? And then he asked, do you know Robin Kirkham? We all know from last trial, Robin Kirkham is an undercover FBI agent that went undercover on the Bundy Ranch page starting in January of 2014. This is before the ranch, before the cattle impound started. This is, uh, once again, proof that there was a conspiracy, a conspiracy against the Bundy family. Um, immediately, there was an objection and it was sustained. Then there was no phone calls to Scott Drexler. Um, they bring up the timeline that they put on there. And in that timeline, they have that Cliven Bundy request the sheriff disarm the BLM and, and knock those um, pay posts down. He brought up what you didn't put on there is Sheriff Gillespie got on the stage right before Cliven Bundy did. And this is not on their little outline. And he said that the BLM had ceased operations and that they were removing their assets 
and the public land was being reopened. That wasn't on their timeline, and he brought it back up for the jury. Then we go into the jury questions. So there was one, two, three, four, five jury questions today. A couple of them had multiple questions on the page. The first one was whose testimony was read by Saylor? And they said, well, that was Eric Parker's testimony from a previous hearing. The second, que the second question was a two-part. What is MOA? And they said, well, that's the group Ryan Payne started. And what is their mission? This is a great uh, this is a great question. They had to bring up the statement. It was entered into evidence, but it was never read fully. So they read the mission statement and it, it's got a who, what, where, when, and why. And all of it is, it, you know, it even says they're going to work with local law enforcement when applicable. They state that they will go by laws as long as the laws do not interfere with the state constitution and the union constitution. So here, I think it was a really good thing to have read. Obviously, the prosecution didn't like it because they went back and narrowed things out of it and read just one line again. But I think the jury is um, getting keen to what's going on here. The next question phone calls. How can you tell who made the call? And the agent went to say that he could tell who made the call based on the phone traveling and where the cell phone towers are coming from. This was argued back and forth by many people. Um, I know that the prosecution got back up and then the defense got back up. They said, well, you can't really tell unless you have a picture of the person using the phone. I believe Perez got back up and he said, you know, at 12:13 there was a phone call made by Ricky Loveland and we can prove this because Ricky, we have a picture of Ricky Loveland making that phone call. It goes to his sister, Cheyenne Miller, and that's proof. But there's not proof. Perez said, for instance, I made a phone or someone made a phone call off of my phone last night at 9:15. Can you tell me who that person was? They can't do it. So they had to admit that yes, unless you have an actual picture, you can't tell who actually made that call. Then the judge intervened and she said, "Well, here's where we go to circumstantial evidence is not what she said and direct evidence." So, circumstantial evidence is a person walks in the courtroom and they've got an umbrella and they and they've got a raincoat. You can deduce that it's raining outside. Direct evidence is that you see that it's raining outside and that the jury will have to go take that to the weight that they give that testimony. <clears throat> yeah, the it the jury has to put the weight to that. The next part of the question, the next on that question, how can you assure a cut and paste post has been edited? They said that they could not. Then the third part, when reviewing the Facebook address for the names, can you identify their aliases? So here we go into this question again about Billy the Kid. And um, once again, he said, after going back and forth between the prosecution and the defense multiple times on this question, he finally admitted that the only people they looked into on um, the many people on this thread were the people that they were investigating. They didn't try to find out who Billy the Kid was. They didn't try to find out if Robin Kirkham was on that, that thread. Um, we all know that the FBI informants, they go in, they, they say things, they make these comments. So, so that they can get people to incriminate themselves, or even their comments are being used inside this uh, fake court in here as evidence against the defendants. You don't have to be the one posting the comment. It just has to be coming to you for it to be evidence against you in the, in the courtroom. <clears throat> My favorite question from the jury today so far, why would you come armed when you are just crowd control and to round up cattle, if you did not intend to use them. Here, we're seeing that the jury understands, they're saying, well, what, what was the point of the BLM being armed if they're just there for crowd control and they're there for cattle? Why did the sheriff bring SWAT team if he's just there for crowd control? I mean, I guess you would bring SWAT team for crowd control, but some people are not, are, are they're, they're realizing there's something not quite right there. They decided that that wasn't a question that this agent could answer, so they asked it, but they didn't answer it. Um, and then the last question, were any of the other defendants communicated directly by Mr. Payne? 
Now, this is where having an FBI agent on the stand works for the prosecution. These guys have gone through extensive training on how to manipulate words. They have gone through extensive training on how to avoid answering certain questions or getting you to answer a question in a certain way ask their questions in a certain way. So he says, well, Mr. Payne did many interviews with media, and, and he was quoted in those interviews, and Parker and Stewart read those articles. Is that an answer to that question? No, the answer to that question is no. So they ended up having to go back and reiterate that to the jury later on with um, one of the lawyers. Um, the prosecution came back and asked if copy and paste was done automatically or if the person themselves had to copy it and paste it. So they said yes, the person themselves had to copy and paste it. Um, the prosecution, like I said, goes through the mission state and pulls out certain lines. Um, states that laws that goes against the state and union constitution are unjust laws. You know, they're, they're really trying to pick this apart. It, it didn't work out well. Jess gets up there and he tries to enter a different part of Eric Parker's testimony to answer the jury's question. That was, uh, the judge says, that's unadmissible evidence and unadmissible evidence does not become admissible just because the jury asks a question. So they're feeling the, they're feeling the pressure here because they're allowing the jury to ask questions and some of those questions they're not gonna like. Um, and let's see, Drexler goes back to the mission statement and he goes back through it, says, you know, where, where it states they'll work with law enforcement, things like that. They didn't look at everyone on the page and that's about it for the day. We are out at lunch here. The end of day report is going to be somewhat short. We have some other things that we've got to get right on to. So, um, like I said, we really appreciate if you can share this, get the information out, talk to your friends and neighbors. You know, just posting something on Facebook is not going to work. Bring up this information in your groups, in your book study groups, um, when you're out grocery shopping. Talk to the people around you, educating people. Knowledge is power, and that's the only way we're going to get things to turn around. Have a good day. All right. So we finished another day in court. Uh, after lunch, we came back with Special Agent Adam Sully. Um, I guess I guess I should talk about some other things first. So let's start with um, Todd Engle actually filed a motion to fire his lawyer to get an extension um, for his sentencing. And it, and it looks like that's going to go through. So we're hoping that he can get better representation. Once again, Todd Engle was the gentleman that decided to represent himself. The judge decided to put his counsel that he was firing as co as co counsel. So when she stripped him of his rights to represent himself, he was forced to have the lawyer that he fired. This guy is um, completely ridiculous. I've seen him myself fall asleep in court. I've seen him watching videos in court and have a pop-up bag go off. Instead of just turning it off, he slammed his computer shut, stuck it under the desk, and it continued to play until the pop-up ad was over. He is not a good representation, so I'm really hopeful for Todd Engel. Um, we are looking for help if you're keen on that kind of information, if you're keen on working on cases like this. Um, and you would like to possibly get involved, please contact us. I think, you know, we'll see how his new counsel goes, but they're looking for investigators and contact Roger Roots. Okay, so after lunch, Adam Sully is still on the stand. Um, he is, oh, this is the new guy, Special Agent Adam Sully. He's in a BLM agent. He is a special agent for the BLM, so that's an investigation team, but he was a ranger before that. He went undercover at the rally on the 7th, and then he, he said he saw about 100 people. He went in plain clothes. This is the gentleman that helped erect the We the People um, polls and the sign in the middle. It was him and another gentleman that went undercover investigating the Bundys, and this is before 
oh, this is the seventh. This is before Dave Bundy was even arrested. So here we go, finalizing that there is a conspiracy, and it's a conspiracy the government made to entrap the Bundy family and get their land. So he was saying that he had pictures of Ryan Payne, Ricky Loveland, Jim Lardy, and the Bundys, and that he was sent there to identify these people. Um, new in his testimony this time is that he stated that he saw Mel Bundy talk with Ryan Payne. And Ryan said some militia would not come until an event took place. Then he saw Mel talking to another guy, and Mel asked that guy if he was with, affiliated with the militia. He said no, and Mel explained that there was a general camp and a militia camp. Then um, he started talking a lot about James or Jim Lardy and identifies Ricky Loveland from the picture that he was given. Then he says, um, let's see, he said JT, somebody named JT told him about the militia camp because that is where the important decisions are made. And he um, had better weapons than the BLM and a vehicle full of ammo. And he was sent there to go undercover at these rallies, at these events, just to get uh, to talk to people and see if anyone had made a plan to interfere, is what he says. His testimony was quite short today, much shorter than the last trial. They're trying to narrow the scope for cross-examination. So we go into cross-examination, and Perez gets up and says, whoever JT is said... Uh, important decisions would be made at the militia camp instead of this hippie camp. I believe that was objected to um, because he was, I don't know, they had to word it separately and he was, it was a play with words. Um, so he didn't get really far on that. He, the guy, uh, who is it? Sully, didn't know who JT was. Tanasi says, he gets up there and says, well, you were provided pictures of Ricky and Ryan and the Bundys, but you were never provided any pictures to look for Stephen Stewart. He says, I do not recall. Of course, back to I do not recall. Um, same thing for Eric Parker and Scott Drexler. He was asked if helicopters were used by law enforcement on the 11th, and he did not recall that either. Then they talked about he met three or four times with the U.S. Attorney's Office, two times with the FBI, and that they went over process possible cross-examination questions and told him probably told him if you don't want to answer say I do not recall if we all remember this is Dan this is the reason Dan Lev is being investigated because when he started to get investigated he went around to all of his employees and said I do not recall is a good answer when you're being um, questioned okay then we go to Leventhal he asked if he was ever in a undercover capacity other than this event he had said that he had um, he asked about a sign that he held on the 7th um, that was objected to, and we didn't get to hear what a sign said, but I'm guessing that it was probably um, really out there to try to attract those kind of people to themselves. Um, he points to a large group of media and says, you didn't talk to them, you didn't know what they were doing there. And then a, a couple more questions about JT. So then the cross-examination is over, and we come to our favorite part now, is the jury questions. We all love the jury questions. So jury question 11, prior to April 7th, have you ever been undercover before? Yes, he was. Second part, how many people were at the rally on the 11th? He says around 200. Uh, next jury question, number 12, can you see any differences between the different militias? Is their clothing different? Um, identifying features that, can, uh, that you can identify the Arizona militia from the Montana militia? He said no, and he was not given that kind of information. Question number 13, this is my favorite. Did your conversation between you and JT give you a reason to look into him more, considering that his comment about the ammo? He said no. They were not familiar with him, and it was not, and he decided not to look into it, or it wasn't his choice to look into it. So here we go. We don't know if this JT person is an informant. We know they've been talking about Mark Kessler inside today, so we don't know if that's an informant, another informant, and the jury's picking up on this. Question number 14, what were you wearing? He was wearing Wrangler's boots, a cowboy hat. He was um, not armed or car concealed carrying. That was the second part of that question. But he said, he said he wasn't or he didn't think so at the time. And then they asked about what vehicle he drove. Isn't this a great jury? They have some really wonderful uh, questions. He said it was an unmarked rental the first time and possibly a Dodge pickup the second time. 
And then number 15, how can the statements from an unknown individual, JT, impact the defendants? Why is this being brought against the defendants? Um, I do have to say that jury questions are now my favorite part of the court day. Thank you for holding that. Because, um, but you gotta hold it facing me there. Because they're the ones that can actually ask questions, and I don't think the judge can just not ask their question. She can refuse to a answer their question, but she just can't not ask it. Um, okay, then the sixth one, could the general camp and the militia camp be put on a map? So then we took a break, they brought a map in, and they put the two camps on that map. Um, he said, and then they went back into questioning. Tanasi asked how many people on the 11th. He said, um, at the height, when there was a media, um, the talk or whatever, that there was probably about 200. So now the next uh, person they bring in is Alex Ellis. We remember Alex Ellis from the last trial. He was with Fl Michael Flynn from Utah. He is a reporter um, that was covering the protest. Michael Flynn is deceased, and they're bringing in Alex Ellis to get his um, video into the courtroom. They don't need this video. They're getting this in because Michael Flynn narrates all of his video in a very negative way for the defendants. Um, so Alex Ellis was actually 17 at the time of the ranch, and he was just going around with Flynn. So they bring in all of these things. Um, Alex Ellis identifies Eric. They just take short clips out of different events, and they wait until there's people in the crowd, and it pans by, and they're like, okay, well, this person's a defendant here. Do you recognize this person? Alex Ellis did say that after, in between the two videos, that while they were waiting for the sheriff, people got on the stage and they sang songs and they read poetry. Doesn't They sound like terrorists, don't they? Um, at that point, the judge says there, oh uh, yeah, so there's an objection to the fact that this is not his evidence the, and then chain of command. Judge says there's no rule that a person has to be the person who took the video, just that it is fair and accurate representation. They're um, objecting to the voice of Flynn. Um, he says they are going to take the cattle by force. They are going to shut down the freeway. This is the type of narration that he's doing over his videos. Um, it's really negative towards the defendants, and that's why the defendants don't want this video to be played. The video being played without the audio would be fine, but the reason they're trying to play this is to get the audio in. Um, then they play another video. This video is not Flynn's video because you see Flynn and Alex Ellis in the video. I believe it's Dennis Michael Lynch's video. And my question here is, they play the video, and this is Cliven's speech. It's Cliven's speech in between when they're waiting for the sheriff. And they do the national anthem and then Cliven's speech. First they play it with Flynn's video where he talks about how they're going to go down and, and do all this. Then they play it without Flynn. And my question is, why do we need to play it twice? And who recorded the second one? So, you know, all rules are thrown out the window here. We're just going to bring whatever we want in. They bring up the stage. Some He says some people at the stage were Oath Keepers. Um, he did not see where they came from or where they went. They brought a map of the wash. He, you know, did lines of where they were parking and this, that, and the other thing. There was an objection to foundation and chain of custody. This is coming from all the defendants. Um, once again, the judge says, um, this is not a fair objection. Uh, she overrules it. They play another video, one of Todd walking down the freeway. I'm not really sure why they're pushing Todd into this uh, trial so much, possibly because he's already been convicted. Um, it looks like we've had 13 sidebars in two days. They keep having all these different sidebars to keep everything away from the jury. Once again, now when, they're, when they have a sidebar, because they're trying to keep the jury from feeling negative about these sidebars, they've got a big bowl of candy now, and they give candy out to all the jurors while they're having the sidebar. Isn't that interesting? We can't have a piece of gum, but they can have a big bowl of candy that they're passing around. Um, there's new signs outside the courtroom that says your bottled water has to be 16 ounces or lower, but it also says that they give 
they have the right to uh, deny or approve people other than that. One good thing I can say, I know they're all watching, so hello everyone. I really appreciated the fact that you m did not make him get out of his wheelchair today. If there's one good thing that about d going down here and doing these is that small injustice le is like that can be uh, rectified. So I appreciate it, Marshals. I appreciate that you didn't make him get out of his wheelchair to get into the courtroom today. The last time. The last time. So um, that's really awesome. Other than that, we have not gotten into the cross-examination of Alex Ellis or the jury questions coming from Alex Ellis, so this should be interesting. Um, oh, and yeah, it was Ashley that was kicked out of the courtroom um, for, the entire for the entire trial. So apparently during one of the uh, sidebars, she was trying to figure out jury numbers and had pointed in that direction, and so they, they kicked her out of the courtroom. They said, you're too animated, you can't be in here, and you're out of the courtroom for the entire trial. They are coming after me, they don't want me in there, they don't want me out here doing this. Of course they don't want anyone that can get the truth out. So, um, it's getting tougher, they're going to try to uh, take our support away inside the courtroom. There's a minimal amount of people in there now that people have kind of gone away for the weekend. We had a really good crowd for the weekend, people are always coming down. If you're local and you can get down here, we need extra people because they're, they're trying to eliminate us one by one. I know they'll be coming after me. Um, there was another part of Flynn's video. Here, got to tilt it up just a little bit. There was another part of Flynn's video. Um, this is the part that everyone always laughs, and I think it, it kind of takes away his sting of what his commentary. But at one point he's saying, the kids, the, there's kids in the wash, there's kids, there's armed children in the wash. Oh wait, no, that guy has a beard. So everybody laughs again. Of course, our side, we've already heard it before, so we didn't laugh as loud as the first time. I thought we would all be kicked out of the courtroom the first time. The jury did laugh just as loud. And then they played, once again, they played Eric Parker's um, interview with Flynn. Now, mind you, when Eric Parker interviewed with Flynn, Flynn was going down the freeway trying to push his narrative like the media always does. He was going up to everyone and saying, what about the kids in the wash? That was his big thing. Kids in the wash, and, and they're, they're endangering the children down in the wash. And so he was going down the line, and he was harassing these old ladies about kids in the wash. And so my husband decided he was going to take it upon himself to get that guy away from the harassing those old ladies. And he brought him over and said, why don't you talk to me? And he said that, yes, he did believe that having kids down in that wash was a good thing. And it maybe was the only thing that prevented a Waco or a Ruby Ridge style event from happening at that time. They're using this evidence against him. They're going to try to prevent him from talking about a use of force. He also brought up at the end, he, he said he believed that what happened that day was a great thing and that it should continue to happen. That there's a rancher in Texas that they're trying to take 30 acres, 30 acres from him. 30,000 acres from him. I don't know. It's some a large amount. And um, they said, you need to get down to Texas. Get on a bridge. Show him force. And they're not going to let him explain what he meant by show him force in the, in the courtroom, I'm guessing. That was something that they tried to get in from his testimony earlier. They weren't able to get, him in, get it in. So hopefully, since they brought it up, we can talk about it. Um, once again, they are preventing us from putting on our defense. We're hopeful that the jury will see through this. I'm really enjoying the jury questions, probably the highlight of the day. Um, if you want to see a production, come down and join us in the courtroom. We can use you. We can use you outside. Um, share this and get the news out. Um, we also stand with such a great event. We are going to do a stand two. Um, a t a, the date is October 5th, so um, keep looking for updates. We're going to go bigger and better than last time. All right, that's all we've got.